I would, first of all, like to um, give credit to um, two of the artists that I recognize up there that are, are he one of whom is here. The third, I don't know. Uh, I'm unfamiliar with that artist altogether. Uh, the, the Yoko Tsutsugu uh, is one of the artists in this book. She is not on that screen, but she's present. R Yoko? There she is. So, so somebody, uh, somebody has replaced her on that screen. Uh, also included in this book are Evgenia Fisher, who is, who is not here. All three of these people are now out of the league. Um, and Diane Englander. So they, they are also up there. I have to take uh, responsibility for the first two on the left side, the top two on the left side. And, uh, oh, Yoko is there. Yes. It's just the one in the upper right. I don't know who that is, respectfully. But the first three uh, on the left and the first one on the top center belong to me. No, the first two on the left, the one on the top center, you can see where this is going. Um, <laughs> uh, the considerations that have been given to drawing um, by my colleagues uh, are very, very, very wonderful and, and very beautiful. Um, so, um, I don't want to get involved with a reiteration of the things that we all of us up here on the stand, on this stand, at uh, this uh, uh, podium can agree on. I have some questions with respect to drawing and some statements to make about drawing uh, because I think that drawing is in, is in fact whatever else it may be doing, it is a kind of questioning. And the questions are not always an easily answerable. But at the time that the drawing is being made, those questions are being asked by the artist and those questions need to be respected and looked through. So, for example, the word drawing itself, what does it mean? It, it's a word, and it means many things. And it means many things depending upon where one goes and who one is talking with and who the artist is and what part of the world one is standing in. It is a curatorial, uh, academic way of categorizing a certain kind of thing but it is not always clear, not always, and increasingly not always, um, when something is a drawing or it's something else. Is, is paint on paper a drawing? Uh, I think there are many of us who would say so. Uh, does it require the use of something that makes a line as opposed to a tone or what? How do we define this? What are we talking about? So I, I think that uh, there are decisions that are made with respect to what is and what isn't and when it's happened and when it occurs and what we're talking about is sometimes dependent upon who it is that's doing the looking and the deciding, uh, which can make things very complicated in terms of the artist's sense of, uh, of themselves and what they're doing and how the world sees what they're doing, if they care. Uh, and then this, this issue has become compounded further by technological developments uh, that we're all aware of. We're living with a lot of di digital technology today, which brings into question other possible ways that one can reach a mark in space and configure it however one wants to. And with the advent, I suppose, of pressure sensitive uh, uh, keypads, uh, we may very well be into a whole new universe or another universe uh, of drawing, at least from a technological standpoint. Uh, then there are cross-cultural issues. Uh, uh, understanding that, that anatomy classes are very popular always, they are generally uh, confined to uh, anatomical concerns that are uh, with a very strong bias Western. Uh, and there is uh, then a, 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 almost a disregard for, for example, uh, if one gets to the drawing of the eye, uh, people's eyes are different in, in the Far East than they are in uh, Uzbekistan and different in Uzbekistan than they are in Iowa and so on. And uh, this is often disregarded in favor of something that's considered a systematic approach to basics, fundamentals, and I wonder what those things are and whose are they. 
Well, this is a this is a matter of some considerable concern, and I think that what we're carrying with us, a lot of us these days, is a legacy that was born out of Central Europe, Italy, and Northern Europe during the time of the Renaissance, and is carried right forward into uh, the Art Students League and SBA and Pratt and every place else, where people talk about fundamentals and basics a lot. I don't think the fundamentals and basics that Hokusai or Utamaro or Hiroshiko were involved with, if they were at all, uh, ex are related except in spirit, perhaps, to what we, we are generally talking about in these, in, in these studios. Um, when does a drawing occur? How do we know when we have one there? How do we know? Maybe drawing goes on all the time. Maybe it's something that happens at all times when, when marks are being made on any surface. Or does one separate those things away from other things and say, if a brush is being used, it's not a pencil, and if a pencil is being used, it's not a roller, and so forth. But what happens when you have an artist that's moving things across and around and composing in a surface, on a surface, and with different surfaces? What is that? What do we call that? And what happens when, when there is an individual who is working wonderfully well with a, uh, uh, I don't know, the, the hip bone of a hamster dipped in ink and drawing on a piece of wood? Is that this is not a drawing, I suppose, even if it's successful. Well, that's a shame, really. It rules out a lot. Perhaps the romance of the art school is gone at that point, but I don't think it's a great loss. Um, uh, so I think, I think one of the things that is very important to, to artists, and I don't know that they articulate it always, um, and I think it's very important for people who are, are confined to art schools for some period of time in their life, um, is to somehow figure out for themselves when, in fact, they have what they can feel constitutes a drawing in front of them. And it matters not if that piece of work that they're taking uh, uh, under their arm to an, a, drawing, a competitive drawing exhibition is turned down at the door because it's done on, on uh, uh, a piece of fabric rather than on a piece of paper. It may very well be done on a piece of fabric and be, and be turned away at the door because it wasn't done on paper. It's preposterous in my view, unless we define drawing in only one single way. Um, in, for, as far as myself is concerned, apart from statement, I, when I'm creating, I'm drawing all the time. Whether I'm nailing a piece of wood to something or I'm cutting a piece of metal, I am in fact creating shape and space. And it's being done, either, if it's not being done with a line, it's certainly being done with an edge. And if it's not being done with a tone, it may, it may certainly, there's a value that attaches itself in terms of light and dark to what it is that's present there unless we want to strictly define drawing as something else. But I don't believe it's possible to make art, for visual artists to make art without drawing. And Mahler believed, and so did Schoenberg, that drawing was possible with music. And certainly Debussy did as well. And Debussy included painting into that idea. Um, I, I'd like to just mention, I'd like to just say something additionally. Uh, we are all trained very hard to understand as a serious and important aspect of drawing Italian Renaissance perspective. Well, surely we must understand that there are other perspectives in this world, and those, ex those perspectives of the universe and of humankind and, and, how to give, and how to give expression to those perspectives are very, very different than the perspectives that, that we are frequently drilled in in order to know that we're competent in art schools. That's one thing. Italian Renaissance perspective and Northern, Re Northern Renaissance, Renaissance perspective, which are different, had a reason. They were, there were cultural reasons, there were geopolitical reasons, there were religious reasons, and all of that affected what went on, and, and no one of these things is more correct than another. Even in Italy, prior to the Renaissance, Madonna was keeping an eye on you from her perspective. It wasn't that, it wasn't that, that, the, that, that Giotto and, and Cimabue didn't know what the hell they were doing. They had a different scheme of things. 
So they drew it that way, backwards. They were no less competent than Piero della Francesca, whom I love. So if we're, gonna, if we're gonna get involved with one thing, we should try to understand all of them, and I think most artists do. It's just hard to, it's just hard to concede these things sometimes. If one looks at mogul art, for example, if one looks at Persian miniatures, one sees a use of space and drawing in space that involves something that has absolutely nothing to do with placing a single human being at the center of the universe looking at everything else. It just doesn't. And the expectation that somehow one should be able to cross that boundary and get to this other one uh, is, it seems to me, is a, a rather biased one. Um, as for myself, uh, my, favorite, my favorite drawing in all the world, indeed my favorite work of art in the entire universe, as far as I know, not having gotten off this planet, um, it was a drawing called Six Persimmons, at least it was it's been titled that by an artist by the name of Mu Chi, who was a 13th century Song Dynasty uh, monk. Um, it is an exquisite piece of work, in, and essentially in blacks and whites and grays. And I, I would urge those of you who haven't seen it yet to, to, to do that. Um, uh, I suppose that one should really have a romance with what, whatever it is that one is calling drawing. And that, that drawing romance, whatever it consists of, it seems to me is probably a lot like every other kind of romance that goes on in one's life. Thank you, Bruce Dorfman. Our next speaker is Bill Benkin. Bill. What a bunch of hard acts to follow. Oh, there it is. One of my students is here. I want to first say to James and, and to Ira that I was very pleased to be considering there are 80 members or so of the faculty, that I was one of the 15 chosen to uh, participate in this. Um, I am an academic, as many of you are. I think I teach at City College and I have to do a lot of writing, so this was kind of a great pleasure for me to focus on, on how I like drawing, what I like about drawing, and how I teach it to other people. Uh, you know if you get the book that the questions that we were asked were, how do you teach drawing to professionals, amateurs, and people who are just sort of interested bystanders? And I had that experience because I teach art history to students who just say, well, I have to take this course. And I love to share what I love about drawing and other arts. Um, I began as a painter when I was a teenager. I drew when I was very little. I just drew to, for the pleasure of drawing. It was only when I got older and had to think about why I do these things that I um, thought about what happens when you draw. It, Yes, it lifts up your spirit, it also touches something inside of you, but it holds on to experiences that you feel very, are very personal and precious to you. Uh, things that, that are evanescent can be held in a drawing. When I was little, I liked things like animals and birds and marine life, so I, I was born in the Bronx, still live there, and would go to the zoo with a best friend and we would take a sketchbook and I would draw things that I liked. Uh, so it wouldn't go away. You could always go home and look at it. Uh, I begged to be taken to the aquarium when it opened in 1957 so I could go and draw fish and I, sea, seahorses and things that I liked. And then I went to the High School of Music and Art where we were introduced to fine art. And in a sense, it relates to what you say, Bruce, that there's a kind of world that's the real world of art and uh, my teachers kind of excuse that you didn't make drawings of fish and birds. That was kind of illustrative. It was also a time in the 50s when I was taught that, well, maybe you're not supposed to draw representationally, which was kind of a shock to me because I thought drawing was representing what interested you. And in that interest, you developed a style or you developed a selectivity in how you drew. But we lived through a time when only abstract expressionism was valid about 1956 or 7, I was 16 and 17 and pretty impressionable, but somehow I kept thinking, but I have to learn to draw first. But what I learned from looking at abstract painting 
and I don't like the word abstract anymore. I think it's, first of all, it doesn't explain itself. I began to see that the uh, characteristics that I saw in Asian art and in the abstract artists of the 50s and 60s, and Piero della Francesca, who we both love, and Vermeer, and all the other artists that were mentioned, and that the underpinnings of these works were also drawing, that the act of organizing your vision, of organizing your page, was exciting to sort of feel intuitively that something belonged in this spot, you moved it over here, then I began to hear about Hans Hoffman with his push and pull, and I thought, well, that's so obvious, I don't know why it became such a famous dictum, because everybody did that, and he became like a god, because he, he kind of characterized it. I'm not exactly a Hoffman fan, you could probably figure, but the very act of making and moving and placing forms, as my colleagues have talked about, anim animating the space, when that came together for me, it made drawing even more real and alive. And so when I teach my students, I don't teach drawing here, I teach printmaking. And so I don't have a model and I don't have a still life set up. I don't have anything that they have to draw. They have to come in and engender their own images. And as you can see from here, the three lower images are my students. The one in the center is uh, James Haggerty. I'd like James to stand up. The one on the very left bottom is Julie Abraham, who is also a professor and was, has called me just before that we came here this evening saying that she had a very, very long day with new school has started at college. She teaches at Sarah Lawrence and uh, does colloquiums with her students and she was dead tired. And the one on the right is by Michael Hewing, who works day and night and sometimes doesn't get enough time to do his own work. I was hoping they'd all be here because without my students, there'd be no product and there'd be no interaction. What I do with my, draw my printmaking students here is to encourage that they find their vision and through the particular media that we use. So we use things like etching where you're biting deeply or not so deeply into copper or they're working on lithograph stones. And so there's a variety and quality of line that gives energy and, and force to their expression. But I do teach drawing, I teach foundation drawing at City College and I mostly teach students who are not art majors. So I have that big audience of people who are sort of, they'll, they'll be visually literate, hopefully, when they come out of the class. And I try to get them to see that drawing is not just copying what they see, but it's an attempt to sort of feel what they're looking at. And I emphasize design and that, then the placement, that it gives, that's what gives life to their drawings, is the spatial organization. And those who know my work know that I, those are the three pieces on, four pieces on the top. Uh, what really became very important for me when I was a younger artist in high school was having seen painters like Tintoretto and El Greco and all the other great masters that were mentioned and Surat and the drawings of Surat and drawings that I remember being afraid when I was young to go too dark, to push the pencil a little too dark, that what if you made a mistake and you couldn't erase it? And I began to learn that those ranges of value were really very expressive. People talk about line, because line is such a, a vivid and expressive kind of movement, the sense of movement. But tonality is also movement. It may be very subtle that you shift from one to another. But I discovered that by pushing it, that getting a really great range of values was very passionately expressive for me. It may be one of the things that I kind of lay the trip on to my students in printmaking, not to be afraid to go dark and let the lights make great contrasts. How do I sum it up? Drawing for me was just a natural thing, and, uh, and talking was a natural thing. My mother told me I was probably born talking, and uh, so to teach it and to share it, and to share the passion of what it is to make, make, to make things with whatever, any medium, as you say, whatever, whatever medium. I didn't think it was considered not a drawing if it was on cloth. You know. And I know that persimmons, I was shown that five persimmons in the High School of Music and Art in Art History. Uh, do you mind if I describe it a little bit? It's kind of a vertical composition, lots of air at the top, and four little persimmons kind of coming across, a little space, you know, an interval, almost like in music, and then another one, and one just shifted a little bit below. And even the variations in their stems are different, and the values are different. 
And it's just this wonderful little world of everything is in it. Everything that's in a great drawing is in that. It's one of my favorites, but I have many other, like Surat drawings and Rembrandt drawings and all that other kind of thing. And prints, ladies and gentlemen, look at prints. Don't ignore them when you go to the Metropolitan Museum. They're fabulous. They have texture, line, value, everything else, right? Great design. What else? That's it. Thank you. And thank you for this huge audience. Huge audience. Thank you, Bill. Our next speaker is Sigmund Abelese. Sig. To start, <clears throat> the content is very much a critical element of my work. Uh, when Bill talked about hanging on to things, I'm very interested in that. I drew both of my parents dying and dead. I drew my premature son, who was born at two pounds and was in a hospital for four and a half months with five huge operations in his first week, um, every day. Uh, I draw every day. Most of those drawings don't go into finished works of art. They're drawings in and of themselves. Uh, I, had mainly, my main career was as a printmaker, best known as a printmaker in the 60s and 70s, and um, looking at someone like Colvitz, I would see these drawings for those prints, and then I would see the prints, and I never knew how she or Degas, two favorite artists of mine, were able to keep that living, breathing spirit of the formative drawing in the final work. I mean, maybe it was a tracing, but it, it had so much life. And so each drawing, somehow I try to invest it with everything I can. I think it, with students, if I could, like you throw someone out of a boat, you have to swim for your life, if you had to draw for your life. When I, when I drew these situations that I wouldn't have another opportunity to draw, that moment, uh, I'm, I'm very energized and very, uh, and there's a kind of um, whatever, and, and I've been um, attributed to this term that I use a lot in teaching, which is drawing is touching at a distance. Sort of the basis of the, of the blind contour drawing. That if you don't really believe you're, you've made contact with that edge, that form, that shape, stop for a minute until you really are there again and then try to um, capture what's in front of you. Another part of drawing for me ha has been the start. It seems to me because again, I guess what I'm suggesting is speed or spontaneity has a lot to do with it. And certainly you see that in Hokusai. Hokusai and Rembrandt to me are like, like cross the world buddies. They really do feel similar in terms of the thickness of the line, the, the, the touch, and, and what they're able to capture. Um, I, I was born in Brooklyn and in, in the Hasidic community, <clears throat> and my mother took me out of there when I was two years old to the coast of South Carolina, where I discovered art. There was no art in any of the schools. Uh, there wasn't an art teacher. It's sort of interesting because there's a guy named Brian Rutenberg and, abstract landscape painter. He's 31 years younger than I am, and he went to the same schools, and there wasn't an art teacher 31 years later down there. But in a certain way, I found my way, because, because there was a sculpture garden, Brook Green Gardens. I don't know if any of you have ever been there. But I went down there every afternoon after school, and I filled sketchbooks. I, those, those sculptures were anatomically correct, more or less, and uh, they stayed still. And, um, and being there, I mean, it was, you know, we were the only Jews there. Um, the Ku Klux Klan bought, burned a cross in their yard. Um, it, was, it was tough, and, 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 and becoming an artist was tough. But somehow, I discovered art through Life magazine. First centerfold I knew about was the Sistine ceiling, which I taped up over my bed. 
because that was the first centerfold I ever saw was in the light. It came out and there was the whole Sistine ceiling. And then there was a wonderful Van Eyck altarpiece. These things became my life in a certain way. And I was allowed, if I stayed in pre-med, so I would be able not to starve, I was allowed to come to art schools in the summer. So I was gonna paint on the side and I'd say, Mom, what side? Right side, left side. But the Art Students League was the first place I came to, 1954, I was a teenager. And uh, I studied with uh, Reginald Marsh and um, Harry Sternberg, who we really connected with, because at this point coming out of the South, he was very political. I had this whole dream of being um, the Diego Rivera, the Orozco of the Civil Rights Movement. And I uh, discovered later that I was an intimist rather than a public artist. But it's a, it's a, it's a long trail. The trail is sort of whatever. And um, so anyway, in terms of starting drawings, that speed of starting drawings, very often if I teach a pastel workshop and we have a model or something, I try to get people to do three 10-minute starts on three separate pieces of paper, and then look and say, which one's worth working on? I mean, it's just it's subtle changes in terms of the composition and, and these things. I think it's worth that kind of thing. The next thing I'm involved in is, what's the closest thing to you? Because I think you really should start, at least figurative work, being aware of the closest thing to me. But I'm going to go back to Costa because he said something about sculpture. And I grew up drawing sculpture. That's how I learned to draw. So I'm very aware of that thing, but I'm also aware of that Degas said, and it was like a revelation when I read this. I tell myself every day to start my figures, my dancers, my horses from the ground up. And that sense of, of almost the way furniture is, knowing where those corners are, where those points are on, on, on the ground plane is just the way to build up those volumes. Anyway, at night, 11 o'clock at night, I pick up this, one of these guest books and I, I draw Charlie Rose's guest from live television. So I get to draw a lot of terrific people. Um, and uh, I don't know what I do with that drawing. I mean, it's been my life's thing. Southerners are more writers than they are drawers, and I have done some writing, but I'm, I'm most at home in the drawing. Thank you.